I'm Joseph. And I'm Nick. And this is Fish Jelly. Nom, nom, nom. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Okay. I had a nice breakfast, so I'm full. Oh, courtesy of? You prepared breakfast there for me. There you go. All yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was thinking, uh, I don't know what made me want to look at my Apple playlist, but... I thought it might be interesting. Well, to remind people that you and I made Apple playlists, mm-hmm. uh, which we do update or add to. So I'll provide links to those in the description of this episode if anyone cares to listen. I mean, I have an obnoxious. <laughs> the cat wants to say hi. Uh, an obnoxious number of songs on my playlists. Uh... But. Um, what I was thinking about was it's kind of sad how my relationship to music has changed so much over the years Mm -hmm. because I remember being a kid you know and like um, you know back in the 80s and 90s new music was released I believe every Tuesday or was it Thursday? I don't remember my memory's failing me but I would be so excited to go to either like Tower Records Sam Goody, Virgin Megastore and buy like a new cassette or CD. And now I don't even know what's new. So I, I think I'm thinking about this because my playlist really reflects someone who's sort of like, um, like stunted musically. Like I have a very distinct like 80s, 90s, sure. R&B sort of um, vibe that like I just, I mean, I, I don't want to get out of it. I enjoy those songs so much, but... Um, I, I know there's good music being made now and I just don't know it. So, but I was also thinking my very first car. So when you started buying music, how old were you? Oh boy. Probably seventh grade, 13. I started a lot of things that year. So that was like (laughs) 1997. Yeah. And how did you listen to music? See, it, it well, my mother had tapes, so I remember listening to her tape, like, you know, she had, strangely, a lot of things that, looking back, I can't believe she had, but, you know, Aretha Franklin, uh, the But Beatles. on what kind of system? Like, was it a nice, like, stereo system? Were there headphones involved? There was, a, well, she had a record player, she had because that's how I was introduced to Thriller, for instance, and, and Whale Noises on National Geographic Records, but uh, she, I remember there was a distinct period where they bought a new sound system that was like a five, it could hold five CDs at once. And then that kind of started to change everything. Oh, was that the kind that rotated? That rotated. So I remember having, um, my very first CD was (laughs) the Spice Girls uh, because I'm homosexual. And uh, soon after that, I had things like Best of Blondie and Sheryl Crow. So wait, were you playing this music so everyone could hear it? Or were you listening to music on headphones? They, I didn't realize, I didn't know headphones were a thing at that age. And my parents wouldn't let me use it while, I, while they were home or while they were gone. But I figured out how to, of course. And that's how I would have to listen to things like Easy e <laughs> and, then in, and then you got a car in the year 2000? Yeah, no, they, so I, I was in trouble a lot in high school, so they made me, they delayed me getting a license a year, uh, so I think I was in 11th grade when I got a car, no, yeah, I was in 11th grade, I got a Mazda 626LX. Did that car have, that car didn't have a nice sound system, it had a standard. It was, I think it was standard, I think, you know, uh, what, what got us was the, were the oscillating uh, air conditioning. <laughs> but sticking to how we listen to music, mm-hmm. I think... My first car was an 84, like, Toyota Tercel, that, and this was in 1995, and it had a radio, so one speaker, cassette player, and I had plenty of cassettes back then, and the quality of the sound was not great at mm-hmm. all, and then at home, I only listened to music, I did get a very nice CD play, like, personal CD player, as they were called, like a Sony, and the quality was very good at that time. And I would listen to music. Uh, I would connect headphones to it. The quality of which was not the best. I did babysit for a family who had an amazing like CD sound system. Like it was an entire wall. Mm-hmm. So I would bring my CDs to their home and listen to them. So that was the only way I really heard the CDs I had purchased in the highest quality possible. But the car I had had a shitty radio. And it's funny because I remember thinking 
the first car, I'm, I guess what I'm getting to is like the first time you heard music like at a high in a high quality environment. And I'm thinking that it wasn't until maybe like 2001 when I bought, I had bought like a Ford Explorer, like mm -hmm. this big truck and it had a standard sound system. And then I went to like one of those like pimp my ride type places. <laughs> and this was when I first started making a little more money than I was used to. So I had extra cash and I go to this pimp my ride place and I said, you know, I want like my, my music to sound good. Mm -hmm. And I pro I mean, I don't know how much I probably, I probably spent like $2,000, which was a lot of money to me then and now to have like, like a system put in, mm -hmm. but it was, I mean, it did sound good. But it was more like, you know, rattle the car type quality. It wasn't like, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, when I was in high school, that is how I experienced loud music because I hung out with all the hood rat kids and they all had sound systems in their cars. Oh, so in high school, your friends had those kind of systems. Oh, yeah, for sure. So the, the main two straight in the town I was from, they would drive up and down all night smoking weed and just so would you bring, rattling. Would you bring your CDs to play in their cars? No, they didn't. No, no. So you had to listen to whatever they... What, right. what were they listening to? The like Jay Z, uh, who else was big around that? Limp Biscuit, uh, shit like the Kid Rock, I think even. Uh, but that's why I have fond memories of Madonna's music because that was when I was alone with my one friend, uh, who I think he knew I was gay. But these were all straight people, of course. But he he would like to listen to that, but he would only do it when I was alone in the car with him uh, because he liked how the bass sounded on music. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, yeah. So I think it's interesting that, um, you know, ever since that car with the amped up system that didn't have the best clarity, but it, it had full sound and I liked it. Ever since then, I've always wanted, like any car I get, I wanted to have like an upgraded sound system. Sure. But now that I'm like an old man and You're not an I drive man. a car with a very nice sound system, I rarely listen to music in my car. I mean... If we're in my car, we're listening to something, but I'm not blasting it usually mm -hmm. because I'm talking to you. And if I'm driving by myself, 99% of the time I'm listening to a podcast or like spa music to calm my ass down. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just think it's funny that my relationship to music is like, okay, now that I have like a car with a very nice sound system and I have very expensive earbuds that I can listen to music to and the quality of sound so much better, it's like I don't really... I mean, you know, there are moments where I'll say, like, I just want to be left alone and I'll put my earbuds in and just lie in bed and honestly just listen to, like, old... I'll put on, like, a Janet Jackson album and just listen for an hour. And But, yeah, it, mm -hmm. the, the power of music hasn't escaped me. It's just, I, I think, maybe the need for... You know, maybe that's another thing. Like, you know, music can be an escape. And I think when I was a teenager, I needed to escape because of my family issues and being bullied a lot. It was like, I just wanted to get away. So putting on headphones. Sure. Yeah. Was a, And then back then there wasn't streaming music. So it was like, oh, the, the two CDs I have in my possession right now. So I would listen to stuff on repeat. Oh, well, you had to because you just... Right. <laughs> that was the tangible, the finite thing. Uh, but, but, it, but, but when you're a kid or a teenager or even like in college, it's like I had time to escape. Yeah. But now as an adult with responsibilities, it's like there's never a time for me to relax. Like there's never a time for me to get away. So I, I think maybe that's why I don't listen to music as much because... Well, it's fucked up because it's like living in L.A., it's, that's the time that's, that's that you have to uh, condense your relaxation time with something like exploring a new album driving. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, yeah. It's so it's like, I, it's just so weird that I feel like I never, because yes, I could play music while I'm working from home, but it's distracting. Right. Cause I can't, or it'll be very low volume. So it's like, I'm not really enjoying it. So yeah, there, I mean, there's just very little time when I'm by myself that I can just listen to music well maybe you know a lot of times when you're not home that's when i'll put on my earbuds and just like like i'll clean the house relax get a glass of wine and i'll just lie in bed and listen until i, I you know until i has to stop but till it till i return until uh, you return but well, that's you not know, often sure but you know just look forward to the day i die and then you'll have all that 
Uh, speaking yeah. of which, a friend uh, <laughs> bought us a gift for which you t- for wh- another way for you to experience your music. Yeah, uh, a friend gifted us a record player, uh, which is in a really cool like. It's also, I think, you know, designed for like to be like decoration. Yes. Kind of. So that's cute. I mean, I think, you know, having we rarely have. Well, we've only lived here a few months now, but I think it'd be a cute thing to have, like if we had people over. Yes. And then just play a record because the sound is so different than what we're, you know, mm-hmm. it's just a fun experience. I don't have any records except Janet Jackson records. So. I had mentioned that, oh, now having this record player means I, I probably want to go buy records. <laughs> Which is sad because I almost bought you that cheap Jermaine Jackson record I saw the other day. <laughs> no, you know what I think might make sense? I mean, I don't want to start, you know, we don't need more shit in this house, but I do think it would be fun to have like a rack of mm-hmm. records and maybe what would be fun is to get like movie soundtracks. Yeah, I like that. That could play like in the background if we had guests over. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, that was my rant about music. We have Apple Music playlists that are in the description. Just a taste. Well, Nick's is more than a taste. It's a buffet of music. Mine is just... Well, there's. I, I feel like I have pretty... It's a, it's a wide range of things. Sure. All right. Let's talk about RuPaul's Drag Race, season 14, episode 14, which is the semifinals. Mm-hmm. So we have five queens left. Lady Camden... Angeria, Willow Pill, Diabetti, and Bosco. And the main challenge this week was they all had to write a verse. For, the, for the multiverse. For RuPaul's song Catwalk. And then they performed in a video, which is customary for the shows. Mm-hmm. The semifinals, they're in a music video. Um, the production quality of it was better than usual. Um, the song Catwalk's okay. We didn't really witness the process of them writing and recording these verses, which I feel like what, what, whatever the construction of the show and how it's produced has become like wrote kind of, mm-hmm. it's like the most interesting parts aren't even what we see. It's just mm-hmm. like the, like the drama and the, but anyway, they all get out there, do the little thing. Lady Canton ends up winning. And in the bottom are Angeria and Willow Pill who were like the two best friends of the season. Um, well, to start, for the runway, the theme was you're a winner, baby. So they're supposed to wear like their, I guess, like showstopper outfit. I I, I don't even recall. I just remember Bosco that. came out looking like a Marilyn Monroe mm-hmm. type. She looked the same, but great. Bosco or uh, Angeria came out wearing like this black ruffle gown that was asymmetrical, very puffy. She looked like she always looks. Like, yeah, it, she it didn't did. feel like she. I mean, she was giving classic Angeria. Willow came out dressed like a mouse. Yeah, which was cute, but, but it Rainer? was confusing to me. Uh, Diabetti came out wearing. A gown that was distressed, like she had been in a fire, and then it had a bustle that was like in a really like odd placement, mm-hmm. and everyone loved it. And I thought she looked weird. I, I didn't, but I also am not prone to liking her. So. And then who else? Uh, I'm, I'm missing one person. Which I'm, I'm surprised. Oh, Lady Camden. She wore a really beautiful. Yes, she looked great. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm, it's funny. You know, I think there's a bit of a contrarian in most of us, but to see diabetes gain kind of momentum and kind of a, a fan base is irritating to me. Well, I feel like I have to be fair in that even though Diabetes' personality is like repugnant to me, I can't pretend that she hasn't performed very well throughout the season. And like in the music video for Catwalk, she did look the best. Her outfit was the best. They all had to design something for this video. Mm-hmm. And Diabetes looked the best. Um, her verse was, you know... She did a good job. Mm. So, yeah, I just can't stand her. But we watched this episode at the Eagle LA. Mm-hmm. And the reaction from the crowd made it very clear that everyone loves Willow Pill. So, um, Willow Pill and Nigeria lip sync to the song Telephone by Lady Gaga featuring Beyonce. Mm-hmm. 
That was really underwhelming because they're both wearing gowns, so they can't really dance. I don't love how Willow Pill performs. <laughs> I think people were like shouting and I don't mm-hmm. think she's doing anything special. Um, and neither was Angeria, but they were limited because of their outfits. But on trend with the entire season, uh, they both get to stay. So now, you know, we it used to be top three for a long time. Yeah. Then we started doing top fours. I think was and then that, a couple of times we got a top three again. And now we have a top five. What was the, <laughs> la- was the first time that top four was with Shea Kulay and uh, Peppermint and... Uh, Sasha The and, one that won, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I think top four is too much. Like, come on. Come on. Top three makes sense. If you can't make a decision, then... Right. I mean, you need to have another episode and we don't want out then or something. Right. But you can't... <laughs> So uh, having a top five feels just like, God, this shit is never going to end. But uh, the winner is Lady Camden for this episode. So now for next week, we're going to get the reunion Mm -hmm. special followed by the finale. And then I think Variety announced that uh, this year the winner is going to get 150K. So Drag Race increased the prize money to 150K and then... Second place winner will get 50K. So then I saw all these memes of... um, Candy Muse looking all despondent, and then it says like when you find out the runner up gets fifty thousand because <laughs> Candy Muse was the runner up. Was she the runner up? Yeah. Rose was not number two. No. Oh shit. Rose beat her with that Britney Spears song they did. Remember, like Rose beat Candy. No, Candy won the lip sync against Rose. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't remember. Which, even though I can't stand Rose, I do think she did a much better job. Poor. Well, also Wait, Rose was- showed up to the lip sync. A little over, like she wasn't in fighting shape. Well, she'd hurt something. Yes, whatever. But yeah, she wasn't sort of at her best. And then the outfit she wore was so, it was like that body color. Yeah, it wasn't good. Yeah. Uh, Who owed Got Mick? And then Simone beat Got Mick. Uh So then the final was Simone Simone against Candy. Candy. God, I don't remember that at all. Yeah. I I mean, Candy, I mean, Simone had that, (laughs) Simone did look really cool. Yeah. I mean, I was glad she won, but. I guess we have to talk about Will Smith because it's still in the news, but it was announced he's banned from the Oscars for 10 years, which means next year he won't be presenting Best Actress like it, you know, it's how it's customary. customary. Um, That's fine. I mean, who cares? I don't really, at this point, I don't really care. I know Chris Rock has responded and I didn't even bother to read what he said. I thought he said he was waiting until he got paid for it. <laughs> Oh, I don't, um, I don't know. I don't, whatever. It's, t- it's time to move on. I guess that that's the only punishment he's going to get in resigning from the Academy. Uh, but, you know, when's the last time he was nominated for Ali or Pursuit of Happiness? So that was over a decade ago. Well, so. I'm assuming being banned. Oh, I should have researched this. Does being banned mean that, mean that you also cannot be nominated? I don't think so. So then it's like, well, okay. Like, it's not like he's going to stop working because he can't go to the Oscars. Well, it's just like the foreign people that are nominated. They're not part of the Academy. Oh, yeah. I mean, who the fuck cares? Also that. You banned me for 10 years. Okay. I mean, that seems pretty... That was like, remember in the, uh, you probably don't remember, but Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins got banned one year for being outspoken and protesting, I think, on the red carpet but for some for something. Do I still have my $500 million in the bank? Am I still an A-list actor? Am I still, like, I mean... <laughs> Did I still get away with hitting somebody? Have I? I mean, I haven't been like Oscar gold. Like, yeah, um, like he's. I don't know. I, I don't give a shit. Um, you said something about Mark Wahlberg retiring. Mark Wahlberg has mentioned that apparently he gave some interview because he has a movie coming out this Wednesday, which we're seeing tomorrow. Father Stu. Oh God. Uh, and yeah. I'm only watching it because my mom asked to go see it. <laughs> I, I. I was appreciative of the Joe Bell move, but. Anyhow, uh, he said he's envisions himself retiring sooner rather than later. Well, he just put up his Beverly Hills home uh, for for sale, uh, eighty seven million dollars. I was looking at photos of it. It's a beautiful. Well, home. from what was it a few years ago where his regimen was leaked? Oh, his what? daily food and exercise regimen. It just it seems so restrictive that I guess why wouldn't you? <laughs> well, for a man his age to look the way he does because he he can get into. I mean, obviously we all know that he's always had a very nice body but very fit. And then in his you know sort of middle age, like he can still. I think yeah, he still he can still get there, but I, it takes a lot. So yeah, it takes a, I think he's still he's kind of in that awkward phase where he's cast and thinks he's probably a little bit too old for you know over the past ten years. But he. He's fine. 
I, I don't know. I, I don't have any kind of... I don't have thoughts about him except that he threw rocks at black people when he was... <laughs> yeah, and he's... So very, that's usually all I think about when same, I think about him. But he's very, you know, he's very... He's he's come out very publicly apologizing for that and donating money here, there, sure. blah, blah, blah. So he, I'm petty, so I probably shouldn't even bring that up. No, he's I, allowed to make mistakes and apologize. I don't know, him. but that's a pretty bad mistake. Well, Who does I don't that? know. As a t- you know, <laughs> like, well, I shouldn't... Not to play devil's advocate, but it's like, no, that's fucked up. No, because I think like when you're a teenager and you're highly impressionable and you're running around in these streets with other kids who are bad and oftentimes people just go along with things because it's like safety of course like, what was he supposed to do as a teen i don't know what age he was but i'm assuming it was before he was a calvin klein model so he was obviously very young it's like yeah what are you going to do if you're running around with these ki- other kids being bad and then what you stand up and say no this is wrong they're going to gather your ass too so whatever i don't have thoughts about him either um and he's obviously super successful and has all the money and he is a very successful business. I mean, I'm sure he could just live forever off of that fucking wall burgers. Oh so, God. And I'm sure he has a production company. Like this person doesn't need more money. So, no, it's just, I, so let him relax and get fat if he wants to. I don't know. That's fine. I mean, I just think that based on the quality of films he puts out, it probably is okay. So we're going to introduce a new segment called Sorry to This Man, mm-hmm. primarily because Nick believes he shouldn't ever make mistakes. So he... I don't like making mistakes. He that. wants to, uh, sort of during the podcast, call out any mistakes he made in our YouTube videos. Or have we made. I don't... I make mistakes all the time, and I, there's no way that I could retract them because they're too many. I wouldn't even remember. Sure. Um, unless you remember big mistakes. Oh, one that uh, like kind of haunts me is... Yeah, we can retroactively at this point. In Malignant, the Malignant review, I incorrectly referenced a, a Radiohead when it's clearly the Pixies. And I know that, but what for whatever reason... Anyway, my, the, my big, little brain. the yeah. big one this past week was we reviewed the film Ambulance, Ambulamps, Ambulamps, Ambulamps by Michael Bay. And I had commented that my favorite character in the film was the character Castro mm-hmm. played by the rapper Wall- Whale. <laughs> it's Wale. <laughs> it's Wale. But Nick said Whale. And I didn't catch it because I thought you were saying like Castro Whale. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, that's an interesting name. But then it occurred to me like, oh, shit. Because I read a headline saying like that this rapper is in the mm-hmm. movie. And then, because I think he looks like T-Pain. Sure. And then I realized like, fuck, it's Wale. I do know that Wale is a rapper. If you paid me a million dollars, I couldn't name a Wale song. I even looked up, which is what prompted the Apple playlist conversation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I'm like, I've just listened to like his top five tracks on Apple Music. And I have never heard any of these songs. Shade. No, I mean, there are a lot of people I don't know who are popular. No, that's true. But yeah, no, I, I was, I did not know about him until Michael Bay introduced him into my life last week. And so sorry to this man. Sorry to this man. Sorry, Wale. We, we, we now know your name is not Whale. Never again. Just like I'll never pronounce uh, uh, Lena Wertmuller <laughs> incorrectly. And don't expect me to apologize for all the dumb shit I say because we don't have the time. Uh, so films released we didn't cover something called Cow. Oh yeah, Andrea Arnold directed a documentary where she followed a cow around for however many years. It played in the premiere section at Cannes last July, where I did see it. Uh, I didn't even bring it up to you because I I just think you would have been kind of bored by it. Mm. Uh, it's okay. I think that I remember having a lot of conversations with people when it came out or when it premiered, and there were a lot of different interesting readings about it uh i didn't love it but yeah that came out uh what else did i have on that list metal lords oh yeah peter salette uh has a new film his last movie was free held which is not a good film but starring elliot page and julianne moore as a couple uh it's a gay rights film with michael shannon as well it's it's not good and i really didn't like his first film nick and nora's infinite playlist uh, I don't like Kat Dennings. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> as a screen presence, as any kind of present, uh, just sorry to this woman, rubs me the wrong fucking way. Anyhow, uh, he has a new film that came out on Netflix that we did not review. Movies we watched for fun. Oh, and Aileen oh, okay. came out. The, the, something I thought that came out in January, but I was being begged to write a review for Aileen. Which we reviewed on YouTube. In January. Which is the fictional Celine Dion biopic 
but the main character's name is Aline Du. Yeah, where Valerie Le Mercier won her third Caesar. I would recommend it if you like Celine Dion sure. or if you like crazy shit. Uh, but it's it's very it feels like a lifetime movie because it's taking itself seriously, but it's so ridiculous. Um, the the story of this woman singer celebrity is told at breakneck speed. Mm-hmm. There's no depth to anything. No, but watching this woman, uh, Valerie Le Mercier, mm-hmm. play Aline is amusing, and she seems very sweet. Like, yes, they make Aline, but that's the problem with the film. Is like Celine Dion is prob. I mean, that lady has such an odd upbringing, and then has this unique life. On the level of like a Madonna or a Michael Jackson, like just so, so super famous and lives in a bubble. Mm -hmm. So we get no sense of like who she is as a person. So that's disappointing. The music is very good because a French singer whose name I just, just escaped me, but I have one of her songs on my Apple playlist. She um, sings all of the Celine Dion songs and she does a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. But anyway, movies we watched for fun. So when our friends were here, we went to the Alamo Draft House and watched Everything Everywhere All at Once. Mm-hmm. Which I, we reviewed, but I don't, I'd don't. i been the only one to see but it. But you had been the only one to see it. Um, I, and several people asked if I would talk about it. Um, just for the record, we're not redoing reviews like if, because like someone asked if I would redo Batman. and If we even filmed a video about a movie that only Nick saw... I'm not going to film another video. <laughs> I'll talk about it on the podcast, but yeah, I wouldn't make another video. Because then you would have to have re-seen it or rewatched it. Not necessarily. It depends on the time lapse, but yeah. And then it's just like there's so many other things we have to watch and make videos for. It, it wouldn't make sense. But I'm happy to talk about it quickly right now. I thought the movie was excellent. Um, I got emotional many times. I laughed quite a bit. I think... Um, the leads are so charming, particularly the adults. Mm-hmm. Um, so mom, dad, and grandpa. Mm-hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis is <laughs> so good. The movie is just so... Uh, so, of course, I would recommend it. I would probably give it like... I had So what didn't work for me... I, I would say it's excellent. I would give it four out of five. Mm-hmm. What didn't work for me is there were moments where I felt a little lost like I was very open to letting the film wash over me but there were times when I thought okay I also think the pacing of it feels a little off like like the the organization of it made me feel like this feels longer than it should even though everything I was watching was working it just see I think the I th- but I think the way your brain works those mental cues with the with part one, with part, part one, two, one, part, part two, which are all not of equal uh, running time, those parts. So. They are not. And I think, yes, but an excellent, excellent film. I hope that it gets nominated for all the things. Oh, Michelle Yeoh. It's so... But yeah, I was very emotional watching it. I think, you know, we can all see ourselves in all kinds of characters. And I and I thought, like, it was such a, a powerful story and it's such a creative way to tell the story. And I think... Um, like, it's really nice watching a story where it feels like whomever made it, like these filmmakers were obviously inspired and they took like the attention to de like, I really appreciate the attention to detail and yes, but I mean, which is so frustrating to think like, then you watch these bigger budget movies by like a mic, like this fucking ambulance with Michael Bay. And it's like, granted that film didn't have it the biggest budget, but it's like these films with all of the money and you can't, it's just like you couldn't find someone with like a creative thought mm-hmm. or, or an artistic eye and or, vision. Or you, uh, you know, depleted those creative thoughts. That and then been. you have this movie, the Daniels. Mm-hmm. Daniels. Yeah. Daniels, not the Daniels. I'm sure they didn't have all the resources they would have wanted. And they still, I'm sure through being patient and being creative, were able to execute something that feels almost perfect. It's just like, what is everyone else's excuse when you have all of the money? 
Oh, but Michelle Yao and and James Hong and Ki Hee Kwan and um, oh, the husband's so cute. He's so cute. When yeah. the, when we first meet the grandfather, because there's a lot of build up to meeting him. I'm not going to go over the basic story because it's too complicated. But it's basically like an allegory for how would you describe? I mean, her characters sort of like the metaverse is used as sort of a symbol of just her reconciling all of her own demons mm -hmm. and, her, and her, yeah her own life trajectory right and really her relationship between her husband marriage career daughter parenting like all of that it's it's in the words of Cheryl Crow it's not having what you want it's wanting what you got right so uh, I mean I can't imagine anyone watching this and not connecting to it I'm not gonna name names but there was a reviewer who I watched their review of it and she she did not like she it. She did not like it, didn't understand it, thought it was weird. But then that same person watched a movie called We're All Going to the World's Fair, which we're reviewing. Which we're reviewing today. And she loved it. Oh yeah. So I, I don't trust this lady. It's, have I met her? Yes, you have. Wow. But here's here's the thing. That that film we just mentioned is from a, a trans director and, and I get the sense that People are very, critics are very gun shy about being honest about certain uh, products from certain filmmakers. Like, where's your integrity? Because I think like, yes, if someone paid us to talk about a movie, then of course I'm not going to like sit and be like, it's crap, blah, blah, blah. I'll, I'll find a way to stay true to my opinions, but also highlight a, like the story that was told and who it might appeal to. There are ways to sell something, right? Yeah. Like... I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to act like no one's going to get me to... No. I'm not getting paid to do anything. I would make these videos and talk about films for fun. So I just give honest opinions. And the feedback I get is that people like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not like trying to be difficult or trying to... Be mean or rude. I, I think yeah. I'm pretty fair. Yeah. But it's just really weird listening to people. But you know, I've been to enough screenings now where it's just like, oh my God, all of these people seem so fake. Yeah. And, Maybe it's because they like this is like the one thing they have, and like I, I mean I don't know what people are trying to do. No, I think it's that. I mean, it's I've been doing this a decade now in LA, and maybe one or two people I'm friendly with, which to me is saying a lot. <laughs> I think that part of how maybe we're different from other people I see at these things is that we're not thirsty for. Oh, I'm not beholden to anything. Whatever yeah. these people are. I don't know what these people are looking for. Like, I don't know what they think they're going to get by, like, constantly saying they love shitty movies. Like, are they going to make a million dollars from that? I don't know. I mean, there aren't many film critics who are known making millions of dollars. So I guess the difference is, like, maybe I, because I already have a nice life and I oh, have a career and I have a nice house. And I drive a nice car that's and I have money in the bank. You would, <laughs> you would have laughed because I was at a, a packed uh, screening of The Northman on Friday uh, a junket screening and it was so awkward there was a woman talking to another woman and she was standing up at the front and it's, it was at the Rodeo screening room so you, that, which is not a pleasantly spaced screening room and she all I hear is because it's pretty quiet she goes um they, they're talking talking she's like yeah so can you tell me why you blocked me on Twitter <laughs> I want so I want someone I want someone to walk up to me and ask me why I said something. But I'll hurt your feelings and then just so you know. Listening to this poor woman who's seated, so there's this woman standing over here, you know, the the talk about power play and uh trying to backpedal about something and all I hear is the one standing going like, I mean, what did I do? Did I talk shit about you? Like, can you just tell me why you blocked me? <laughs> Bitch. Anyway. Look, I'm going to issue another warning again. But, do not approach me unless you watch your feelings hurt. But also, <laughs> all I could think it was like, I have no idea who follows me on any of those platforms or like, I don't care. Like, who ca And if somebody did, who cares that they're not for you then? Like, why? That's the other thing. Like, why? Why? This really just feels like, I've already mentioned this probably last week about the Chris Rock joke about his wife working mm -hmm. at like the department store talking about the bitch who works in uh, home goods trying to destroy her. That's how it feels watching like people interact in that way. It's just like, what are y'all trying to achieve? Like, what, like if you have a love for cinema and you love writing about it and that like, that's great. Like that's your hobby. And if you get paid, then that's even better. But it just seems, and if you take your craft seriously, which you know, I think I do. I put a, like, 
I put a lot of time into this stuff that people think I'm just being a buffoon maybe, but it's like, I do put a lot of energy into it considering that I am very busy and very important. So uh -huh. like, you know what I mean? Someone like me does not need another thing to do. Sure. So I do this because it, it's appealing enough to me that like I enjoy it, whatever. But so no, same. And it's, you know, it always comes down to like, oh, well you, are you on Rotten Tomatoes? It's like, okay, yes. And then it's like, oh, that that's validating now. And it's like, okay. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't need to be validated. Um, yeah, I'm not going to. I was going to say mean things, but I'm not going to do that. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to do better. Anyway, uh, so everything, everywhere, all at once. Highly, highly recommend. Watch with family. Watch with significant others. Mm -hmm. uh, watch it. I would watch it again, um, actually. If someone wants to take me to go see the Alamo, uh, go back to the Alamo Draft House and get me one of those, uh, what did you order? Cookies? No. Those cookies, they were only $9. Yeah, and there was that shake I got you. Well. A hard shake. It you, had liquor. Are you asking somebody else to bring you to a movie and buy you food and drinks? I'm saying that someone wants to take us to go. Us, uh-huh. Sure, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or just send me gift cards to the Draft house, I'll take myself. Uh, but next is what sex am I? Oh yeah, so I couldn't wait for you any longer because it's going to expire on movie. Uh, Lee Grant's series of documentaries. Uh, I think it's the last one I hadn't seen. What sex am I from nineteen eighty five, where she is uh, interviewing a variety of uh, transsexuals and transvestites, and uh, in, in the important delineation between the those two groups, um, and and just the battle for. Uh, it, it, especially if there's snapshot snapshot from 1985 highlighting a community that nobody wanted to talk about. She even interviews uh, Christine Jorgensen, oh. who's, who's a, you know an older uh, woman at that point uh, about her experiences. But it's fascinating, and uh, and also how terminology has changed because she goes to the scene where there's these club kids, and they're called they they are calling themselves, and she's referring to them as she males. Okay, which of course you know we know is is not appropriate, but it's it's interesting to see how we culturally were grappling to find what we came to as non-binary. Mm. You know, because I believe that's what those, that, that group she was speaking to would mo happily embrace now. But then... That's so interesting because, yeah, if like how things would have been for so many people back whenever, if, if, if we'd had language term, existed. Yeah. Yeah, because it's well, it, it well, and it really just boils down to gender being a construct that is so limiting. Well, because there's not language to support it, it makes it seem apparent. So then that's when people use terms to make fun of. Right. You and know. That, yeah. That's where the that's how shemale came to be. Uh, like you're an aberration. So right, it, you're it, like a an abnormality. Yes. Or a freak. It's so weird. And I think, you know, if I have to choose, um, you know, like a gender and I'm given many options, I would choose male. Like I feel like I'm what I'm told a male is. So I don't question my gender and I don't feel uncomfortable in. Uh, how do I, I, I feel comfortable like saying that I'm male. I'm not necessarily comfortable with my body, but it has nothing to do with my gender. So it's just so unfortunate that we can't just sort of flip the switch and, and look at people as individuals mm -hmm. because really, I, I don't know, just so much emphasis on people's body parts and no one has, no one has a right to know what my genitals look like unless I want them to. Right. So it's just so weird that so much of this revolves around people wanting to know like, well, like what genitals do you have and, and like what kind of clothes you're going to wear and how are you going to look and who cares? Like, right. Right. Like, for our day-to-day -day purposes, like, who gives a shit? Like, you're supposed to respect this person and interact with them in a civil way. Like, the person driving in front of me or the person in the grocery store or the person who's picking up their kid the same time I'm picking up my kid from school, what does it matter how they present or what they do with their bodies or what or what they don't like? Like, oh, for, No, I, I definitely agree. Uh, it's so weird. And I was conflicted about the documentary a little bit because, of course, Lee Grant is, you know, the... In all her docs, she's the one interviewing her subjects. And there is, there's straying into that uncomfortable territory about genitalia. But it, it's, it's coming from a very curious... 
curious place of people that are willing to want to talk about it. And sure. I think there's the first wave of kind of taking away the fear uh, and the misunderstanding that I think maybe culturally people might have needed at one point. But, you know, we're past that now. It, it, <laughs> but, you know, I really appreciate people who are willing to have those conversations. Yes. Because yes. it's like if someone asked me to talk about race, like... I, like usually my response is like, like to some ignorant white person like I don't want to talk to you about that well it's not well my usual thought is like I like I don't have the energy to yeah. try to explain to you like if you want to know then why don't you do research like if you want to know how your um like your fetishi fetishi I can't say that fetishization word. your fetishization of me as a black man is in a pro your sexual fetishization ugh. astrophysicist astrophysicist your sexual fetishization of me as a black man, why that's inappropriate. It's like, I don't have the energy to explain to you. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to ignore you or mm -hmm. block you or whatever. Like, you, so, and you're done. So I really respect people who fucking roll up their sleeves and have to explain to people yet again, in short teachers. <laughs> uh, yeah. God bless <laughs> teachers because like repeating myself over and over again, so I, I, I do appreciate but, it. Oh, you know what else was interesting about that documentary uh, I want to bring up is, especially in these early days where th there's uh, represent some limited representation is how gleefully uh, th there's one father of a, a trans woman who is so happy because she was in a lesbian relationship and then, of course, uh, became a trans man. And then the language is like, oh, well, now she's in a normal relationship. Mm. And there was another person who they were so against being gay because they were brought up uh, in some very restrictive, I'm forgetting uh, what background, uh, and they had a sex change operation, sex reassignment surgery, and they regretted it. They did not want that because they didn't, they were just trying to escape being homosexual. Mm, wow <laughs> like the fear it so it's interesting how you know every trans person every trans person has a different story there's there's everyone's different uh but but it's interesting to see how there are these troubling areas where people are doing things for the wrong reason sure that we would never be able to suss out without visibility i mean i'm just rambling now but this makes me think how like i feel Many gay men have experience being asked, like, if they're in a relationship, like, who's the man and who's yep. the woman? Mm -hmm. And, you know, knock on wood that I haven't been confronted with that. But then I think what's interesting is, yeah, like, hetero people don't approach me asking, like, oh, are you the man or the woman? But strangely, gay men are very preoccupied. Very. With, like, extremely preoccupied with the sexual roles other gay men uh, assume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I find it funny, like well, we don't we don't want that. Like if some if I walk into a grocery store with you and some woman approached me and said, "Oh, you're a couple. Which one of you is the woman?" Like I'd be like, "Bitch, let yeah, me get sure. you together." Yeah, real yeah, quick. yeah. But then, so I would be offended by that. But then someone like me would also then go ask another gay man, like, "What's your sexual like preference in bed? You know, like, what are your preferences in bed, and which role do you prefer?" And, so it's a really interesting... It's interesting. I mean, sexuality is complicated and there's a strong psychological component and how, like, everything that happened to us as children feeds into all of that. Uh, but but it's it's funny how if you say as a gay man that you're versatile, then it's like, oh, well, you're just saying you're a bottom. It's like, no, I, I firmly believe that different people make me feel different things and that there's a different chemistry and a vibe between different people. There are different combinations. Yeah, I mean, I think. God, I'm just. We're gonna have to pause and take a break because we're gonna go long. But the. We went out Friday night, mm -hmm. and then Saturday night, mm -hmm. and I think, like I did. We went out last night, and I I usually drive because I like to be in control of my like my position in space and when I can leave that space. But instead, we took a a, a lift so that we could, or that I could drink a little more than I usually do. Mm -hmm. Which you did. Well, so I took an edible before we left. Half. Half. And then I had... Well, half is arbitrary because who knows the dose. Sure. I took some edibles. And then I had had a drink before we left the house. And then I had like four drinks. 
three beers and a glass of wine. And a glass of wine. So I was feeling like definitely couldn't have driven, but I felt good. So I had a nice night, but I think being out Friday and Saturday and having had chatted with a few people and then just watching people, it's interesting to me, like, I've always said that we had a conversation about this that I think, because, you know, people will ask uh, me, you, we all get asked, like, uh, like how we are sexually. Like, mm-hmm. people will just ask you, mm-hmm. like, what you're into. And we were at a bar that's known for, like, leather and BDSM type places. Mm-hmm. And that's not my vibe. But I was there. Mm-hmm. And people, basically, I was saying that I see myself as, like, I'm grown and sexy. Is how I see myself. Mm -hmm. And that's how I want to present myself. Oh, I see you that way too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I don't, well, so to me, it's like, and we were talking with another couple at one point and I had shared like, you know, I'm not against what other people get into. Like if you want to wear leather and harnesses and do all the things people do. But for someone like me, it's not that I'm against that. I even mentioned, I think on Friday that I wouldn't mind buying like an outfit, like a harness and whatever. Cause I just think it would look cute and it might be something that like, Oh, if I got my body together, it might be something fun to do. But so I'm not against any of it. I just think that for me, if you have a genuine connection with someone and like an attraction that I first, like I don't need all the bells and whistles to get the job done mm-hmm. or to enjoy myself. And maybe I sound judgy, but I feel like people who are really into that preemptively, it's already like you've established that you need all of these external things to feel something. And then you don't even. So what I'm getting at is what I've grown really tired of. And what I actually told someone who had approached me on Friday and then online, I told them this, that I think the issue because they were saying that I'm being like I wasn't responding to them. Was that I think that my issue is that you, meaning people, or this one person specifically, like you're so preoccupied and so bold and wanting to talk to me about sex and wanting to know about me sexually when you haven't established whether or not I find you sexually attractive Mm -hmm. or like, and I think a lot of adult people approach sex that way. Like they just are so bold and they just dive in and they're so like lascivious about it. And it's, it's embarrassing because you don't even know you're not sexy. Mm -hmm. Sexy is like a, it's, 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 it's qualitative. Like it's, it's subjective. And it's like, people just send out this very large signal of like, look at me. I like this done to me this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I guess, you know, your advertising works because you're going to get people who want a very specific thing from you. But I don't know. Well, I'm not shade, shading also, that. Also, like, you know, I'm not a flower that needs to be pollinated. Like, it's not... That, that, the, that transactional... Again, it, it's limited transaction. I I'm think. very sex positive. I'm not shaming casual sexual encounters. I, Same. Like, I, I think I've done many things where it was very, like, you know, all this shit I'm saying went out the window and I was just reacting to a stimulus. But I think as I get older as I am now trying to interact with more people socially. And I don't know. I just think like, all I can say is I try to conduct myself as a grown and sexy person, Mm -hmm. which means that I'm going to give off an energy to you. And if you don't feel that it's because I don't feel it. Mm -hmm. Like (laughs) people ask me if I'm shy, I'm not shy. (laughs) <laughs> to the contrary. I'm just not into you. Mm-hmm. I don't find you appealing. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you are like a good looking person, but that's not enough. Or maybe you do have a really nice part of this. Bar- I think a lot of people think that because they have the specific thing they can offer that like, this is like, you're limiting yourself. Mm-hmm. Like maybe you should focus on being appealing as an individual. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think. Because it's like, I'm not the most attractive person. The sum of all your parts. The sum of all your parts. Because if we're just going off of like, the nicest ass, the biggest whatever, the six pack, the most beautiful face, the shiniest, straightest teeth, the floppiest hair. Like, 
I'm low on that list and most and none of us are at the top. Like there's always someone better. So I feel like that rubric is just a recipe for disappointment and failure. Mm -hmm. And really what we should be focused on is like who we are as people and what like the sort of individual connections we can have mm -hmm. or group. I mean, you know, I'm not saying it has to be one on one. It can be five on six. I don't know. But it, it yeah. I, I went way off topic, but sure did. <laughs> we okay. need to we need to get to um, bringing out the dead. Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, had a Nicolas Cage double feature. That is a Scorsese film I've never seen, uh, where the the ambulance drivers, uh, mm. him and John Goodman and Tom Sizemore, uh, is really dark. Uh, and I don't know why I avoided it for so long because I think I think I thought it would be kind of a chore, uh, but I did quite like it. Uh, Patricia Arquette. It had it's it was made in 1999. It it's set in early 90s New York, and it had kind of a almost a Jacob's Ladder, the Adrian Lyne version film of, of that period in New York that I, I really dig. Um, yeah, I, I recommend it. I, I thought Cage gave a pretty good performance because we watched it the same day as uh, the unbearable, the unbearable weight of massive, massive talent. talent. Yeah, is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> which I did enjoy. Yes. Lastly, we started, so we, oh God, yeah, that happened this week. So you got invited to a, like in an event where John Cameron Mitchell was going to do bingo at Hamburger Mary's, at Hamburger Mary's in, uh, West to Hollywood. in West Hollywood to celebrate his Peacock series, Joe versus Carol. And apparently that Hamburger Mary's event happens every Wednesday and is a big a big so the event we had fun yeah it was fun because it was like um well the covid apparently is not a thing because they had us in there like sardines but it was open everything so we had a nice meal drinks mm -hmm. i was feeling loose i had fun playing bingo you actually won a round of bingo mm -hmm. and you won a nice prize actually mm -hmm. so i did have fun but john cameron mitchell didn't show up in the two and a half hours we were there they told us he was running late mm -hmm. he was it opened at 6 30 mm -hmm. He wasn't there. They told us at like eight, he was running late. Mm -hmm. We left a little after nine. Mm -hmm. He still wasn't there. And then I looked on social media, like people tagging and I didn't see any pictures of him. So I was disappointed that he didn't show up. But since we got invited and we ate those people's food and drank their drinks, I thought we probably should watch Joe versus Carol. Yeah. So we watched episodes one through three. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I don't like it. I don't like it either. <laughs> uh, it feels very reductive. Uh, okay, so I think John Cameron Mitchell is giving a good performance. Yes. Not as not at the level as whatever those quotes splashed by Variety all over that event were saying. But I cannot not see Juliette Lewis in him. He, no. lo he looks just like... Well, I don't know if that's shade to him or Juliette Lewis. But... Uh, no, I like both of them. And they're both handsome looking people. It's just... Uh... I, when I see him in the, the eyeliner in his frame, it, it, he looks like Julia Lewis. Okay. Uh, having watched three episodes, I feel like, you know, Joe versus Carol. I think John Cameron Mitchell is Joe exotic. He's, I think he understands the assignment. Mm -hmm. But fucking Kate McKinnon is Carol Baskin. It's an SNL skit. It is like, it's grating. Yeah. Because it's just like, but she's the same in every SNL skit. Mm-hmm. The same crazy eyes, the same like like the way she moves her mouth. I mean, I I do like her, but I, again, as a what kind of performance this should be embodying Carol Baskin, who I don't I think we were talking also shouldn't have equal weight to Joe because she's a person that whether or not she killed that husband I don't know, but she was a person that was trying to do the right thing. Yeah, we were talking about this. I agree that I don't think it should be Joe versus Carol because in the documentary Tiger King. Carol Baskin's role in his little situation is significant in that she sort of stopped him from doing his road show, which then evolved into him having this park, and then they had this feud. But really, the feud showcased how unstable Joe Exotic is. Mm -hmm. And then, if it weren't for people accusing her of killing or suspecting she killed her previous husband, there really wouldn't be much to her story, because like you said... She's just an animal lover and an activist. And what she was trying to do is not bad work. No, and she's just an awkward 
White lady. She has a lot of questionable behaviors, and then it's like she's trying to shut down these other parks, but then her park doesn't seem... Yeah, and it's, you know, if it's true that she wasn't paying people... You also and... have a zoo, and then she wasn't paying her people, so it's like, well, you treat the animals better than humans, I guess, but... Um, again, yeah. again, not and not at the very least, not interesting enough for her transgressions to have equal weight. I agree. Um, we will probably finish the series, but so far, I'm I find it grating when Kate McKinnon's on screen. Yeah, but I think I like Kyle McLaughlin, but it's just maybe he, right. But he doesn't have anything to do really. Um, but yes, John Cameron Mitchell's Joe Exotic is entertaining, and his little lovers. And then his, uh, yeah, his two uh, lovers, which is, they haven't so far leaned, well, it's explicit. I mean, it's very clear that the one guy is like straight, you know, in a, straight in a relationship with him. And we don't really see them having, like being sexual, but they, it is very clear that they are. And so that's interesting. I feel like for a series that is, has more time than the docuseries, I feel like it's not getting into the details the way the docuseries did. So it's weird that they have the time to do it and they're not. It's also not as... It doesn't not, feel as gritty or graphic. It's just as, not nuanced at all. Yeah. All right. We need to take a quick break and then we'll be back. <laughs> like it's a real commercial. <laughs> Hold on. We're back. <laughs> I, I didn't die in the interim. Uh Projects of interest, Le Revocation. Le Revocation. Uh, so this hasn't been announced anywhere in English-speaking trades. So, uh, listener, this. So is, which language did you read it in? This is a treat, French. Oh. Because uh, you know I do daily uh, Google searches on several ladies. Those <laughs> ladies being Sigourney Weaver and Isabel Huppert. Uh, but Isabel is. Uh, they're doing casting for a new Andre Teshine film starring Isabelle Huppert. Oh. And he's, a, of course, a big, he's a major deal French actor, uh, queer filmmaker. Uh, she hasn't worked with him since 1979's The Bronte Sisters, where both her and Isabella Johnny play two of the three Bronte sisters, mm. uh, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, it, it's uh, at the 70th Cannes Film Festival, which I want to say was 2017, I was at a special event where, because Teshine has worked with a lot of major French uh, Hollywood actors, and they gathered them all to give him uh, a kind of a, a celebration, and they had a special screening for his latest film, uh, which I didn't really care for. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of that. Anyway, Uper was there, and she, uh, I, I think I remember her hosting that. Uh, but all these other major French actresses, uh, I remember Deneuve was there, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so... I always thought it was weird that they had never worked together again because he does make a film pretty regularly. Hmm. Uh, he, but, you know, he's really like working with Catherine Deneuve. She's been in several, many of his films. Uh, so it's exciting to me that he's reuniting with Isabel. Next, The Governesses. Uh, Joe Talbot, who directed The Last Black Man in San Francisco, has uh, announced a new project, The Governesses. Uh, some interesting cast members, an actress from Squid Game uh, and Renata Renz from The Worst Person in the World are two of the three governesses. I'm forgetting who the third is at the moment, but yeah, that should be interesting based on a book. Next, Damsel. Uh, Damsel. Fresnadillo oh, Juan, Bassett. Juan, Juan Carlos Fresnadillo, who did the 28 Weeks Later sequel. Oh. Um, I haven't seen his first... Spanish language film, which was kind of his breakout. I'm forgetting the title of it, 2004. Uh, I think he hasn't directed a film since 2011, with which was a terrible film starring Clive Owen called Intruders, which I remember really not liking. Uh, but he's got a new film called Damsel that he's working on, and Angela Bassett was just cast in it. And it sounds... Oh, with Millie Bobby Brown. Uh, mm, so Millie. that's not exciting to me, but Angela Bassett should Who's be... Who's dating someone named Joseph... Who has the same name that I have. Oh. And. I didn't know that. You know, because I get the Google searches for my name and your name. and Oh. So usually when I get, because I'm nobody. So then every time I get a Google search result for me, it's always about her boyfriend. I think he's a hockey player. Oh, interesting. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. Um, oh, it's okay right now? Uh-huh. Oh. 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 Are well, we, I was done. I was are we going to have a good day today? <laughs> oh. 
Lastly, the trainer. Uh, Tony K. Tony K, the the troubled director of American History X, who <laughs> seems like it's impossible for him to get projects completed or filmed. Uh, he is starting a new film that's been trying to be made for a decade, starring Gina Gershon, Stephen Dorff. I'm forgetting the lead, actually. But it's about a personal trainer in L.A. who lives with his mother who takes a wild shot at fame. Oh, that sounds... Well... Interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, well... Praise be, uh, there are no entries in the obituary section. <laughs> that came up on our radar. That came up on my radar. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say people can email me with their... I would read... Um, like if people send me their... Like the like at a funeral how they have the pamphlet. Mm-hmm. Like reading someone's... Uh, Obit- the, their statements? Statement. Is that what it's called? I don't, I don't mission, know. Their mission... Their, their mission, mission statement for death. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. The secret film today is a film called Gloria, a 1980 film, a, a neo-noir crime thriller film mm-hmm. directed by John Cassavetes. Mm-hmm. Starring his wife, Jenna Rollins. Who, um, John so. Cassavetes is a director and I'm looking at his movies and I recognize Rosemary's Baby. Well, he starred in that. So he, oh, he, oh, so he starred in many films that he would use to finance his own. But as a director, I recognize... I know for one right now that you've seen that you were cranky with me for making you see. Which was? Killing of a Chinese Bookie. I don't recall that. I took you, my mother and sister. It was on my birthday at the New Beverly. Oh, at the, at the New, New Beverly. Beverly. Quentin Tarantino's theater. Yeah. Okay, I don't recall that. With Ben Gazzara. I recall going. Um, oh, I okay. also recall A Woman Under the Influence. I don't. You haven't watched that with no? me, but okay. that 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 General Owen's performance is like. What about faces? Top notch. Uh, faces. You might. I had it on uh, a couple months ago. Anyway, I recognize his name, but I. You know who I think when I think John Cassavetes, I think I'm thinking of Vincent C- Cassell. Cass- or isn't there another actor with a name similar? Well, his children are directors. There's uh, what's it? his daughter was married to Rick Ross for a period of time. Oh, that's right. Was it Zan? That's right. Uh, okay. And then his son Nick Cassavetes is a director who directed. Uh, I, I think m- contemporary audiences are probably more familiar with Jenna Rollins from The Notebook, which is directed by her son. Anyway, this movie is a hot mess express, but oh, I love it. And I was reading reviews, and people love this movie. I think this movie is terrible, it, but I would highly recommend it. I was entertained, but only because I think Jenna Rollins on screen is real. Or uh, yeah, that's her name. Yeah, is really fun, and the little boy, like her, like the co-star, that acting is terrible. Yeah. So okay. So but just a little background. It won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival. It was the second of Jenna Rollins Oscar nominated performances. Uh, but also the little boy, uh, John, well technically Juan Adams, uh, was nominated for a Razzie uh, for his performance. Okay, let me describe the basic story. So Jenna Rollins plays a woman named Gloria. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Gloria lives, in, they're in New York. Yeah, they're mm-hmm. in New York. Gloria lives we find out that she used to be like, she used to like have a romantic relationship with some mob boss and she was kind of part of those activities. Like she knows how to use guns. And then one day I think got in trouble, went to jail. And then when she got out, decided she wanted to have like a clean life. So we find out that she has saved up a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. Like she has a million dollars in a safe deposit box. Mm -hmm. She's living in a shitty apartment building in this building. There's a family, the Dons Mm -hmm. and the man of, Buck Henry and uh, Julie Carmen, who's an actress I'll make a statement on later. The man of the house is a, like an accountant for the mob. And we find out that he's been talking to like the FBI and the CIA. So now there's a hit out on him. And he knows that. So the film opens with him sort of like in a panic. Like we have to get out of here. And the wife is like, what did you do? And it's very clear that they're not going to get out of this apartment alive. So the woman of the house tells Gloria... Hey, because they're friends. She comes over for to borrow coffee. Yeah. She says, girl, they're about to kill all of us. Can you take my children? My older daughter and my younger son. And she says, I hate children, especially she, yours. She says, I hate children, especially yours. I, I can't do it. And the girl, the older girl says, I'm not going over there. But they do manage to get her to take the boy. The mob comes, kills the entire family. And Gloria realizes she needs to leave with no apparent plan. 
the bulk of the movie is Gloria and this little boy named Phil running around trying to like get along and also like deal with the mob mm -hmm. who are everywhere who are everywhere but ultimately Gloria realizes like the mob is inescapable so she needs to just resolve this so she goes to the mob boss who she used to like be in a romantic relationship with and tells him like oh the reason they want the boy is because his dad the accountant had a book that they call the bible with all of the names account numbers money all the shit that they were doing and that and the boy has it so they feel like they have to kill the boy and get the book so gloria goes to the mob boss with the book and says here leave the kid alone he's just a kid he doesn't know shit Here's the book. I'm an, I, like, I know you're going to kill me, so make it quick. And then the guy's like oh, hesitating. So she says, well, I'm going to get up and walk out and you do what you need to do. So she walks out and then all of a sudden they're like, we got to kill her. But she escapes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's ambiguous, which you can get into. But the final scene of the movie is because at that point, when she went to go talk to the mob boss, she told the little boy, like, sorry, you need to just. You need to take a train to Pittsburgh and meet in the cemetery. Yeah. So the end of the, the final scene of the film is the little boy is at the cemetery in Pittsburgh. Gloria shows up. They reunite the end. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, my I'd goodness. always, I had always, if I ran a theater, I would want to do uh, uh, two triple features uh, or uh, two double features. This, and it's, this was remade in 1999 by Sidney Lumet uh, starring Sharon Stone. Uh, so I think it'd be, oh, I would watch that. it'd be fun to watch those two backs back and then Sebastian Lilio's Gloria and the remake he also directed Gloria Bell with Julianne Moore <laughs> this movie is laughable the dialogue is okay terrible so Cassavetes wrote this to sell the script it was supposed to be a vehicle for Barbara Streisand who turned it down and then the studio offered it to be a starring role for Jenna Rollins and for him to direct so this was a script that he was never really happy with anyway and yeah i think it shows especially with the the child's the child's dialogue. could i just go through my notes so uh the dons the woman of the house julie carmen she is gorgeous yeah okay so she uh is in fright night part two but she is one of in a favorite film of mine as a kid which is john carpenter's in the mouth of madness okay but I'm, yeah i don't think i'm familiar with that one um we meet her on the bus and she's kind of be acting a little frantic and she has one of those like carts like that people carry groceries in mm -hmm. and it's filled to the brim. And as she gets off the bus, like she falls and the groceries fall. But I thought it was funny because this woman is very thin. Mm -hmm. Seems like she has barely enough strength to hold up a credit card and she's carrying around this basket of groceries but we see her like running through the halls holding the groceries up like mm -hmm. it's like a bag of feathers mm -hmm. <laughs> that's when i knew this movie was going to be some bullshit like the attention to detail is terrible um when she gets home we can tell that everyone in that there's tension like something's happening and she's arguing with her husband and they keep saying, like, I don't want to talk in front of the kids. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk in front of the kids. <laughs> Which then we, we said, that probably is a good approach. Because, mm -hmm. like, I'm sure my parents had way too many conversations that we shouldn't have heard as kids. Um, but ultimately, then they're like, the mob's going to kill us. So I don't know why you were trying to hold back on your <laughs> conversation because y'all are going to die. Um, then, yes, when Gloria is trying to, like, she says, like, I hate kids, especially yours. I just thought, oh, this is this, this is not going to go well. The little boy, how old do you think he's supposed to be? I think I read he was eight. He's supposed to be six or something like that. Oh, my God. He looks and acts like a 55-year-old man. They have, I mean, I know it's the late 70s, but he, the way he's dressed and his hair and the way he walks and then the dialogue, he can't act. He can't, poor thing. And then he, sometimes it's... I don't know if those were impromptu moments where it's like, oh, he's acting like a kid. And then sometimes it's like, oh, this motherfucker is so inconsistent. Talking about how gruesome it is to be in the graveyard. Like, yeah. Like, I think that's the director's fault. Like, and maybe the script supervisor, like this kid is in some moments acting age appropriate. And then in some moments really does act like a middle aged man. Mm hmm. And I can appreciate that maybe he's mimicking his dad. I think Because so. his dad does tell him before he dies, like. You're going to be the man. You need to be the man. Yeah. So I, I think that's what they're trying to convey. But because this kid can't act, it just comes across as like, 
he's possessed. Yeah. He, this characterization would have fit better in a movie about a, a young boy who was possessed by a middle-aged man. Because it's Like so, JD's Revenge? So, yes. Like, it's so bad. Um, so That Glor- said, even a better testament to Jenna Rollins still being able to pull it off. Oh, she is a delight on screen. I love how she looks, the way she's dressed. It's very... Um, I, I, I think if you're the type of gentleman or a person who likes seeing sort of like campy women, like if you like, it's almost in the vein of like a mommy dearest kind of like this performance is a little over the top. It's not that great, but I I, I could see people enjoying it solely for her. That's the only reason I, they were, I, I read it they was were, tolerable. They were trying to mimic uh, like that style of acting like of Humphrey Bogart or James Cagney from the 50s. So Gloria absconds with little Phil and she goes to a friend's apartment like across town or Mm -hmm. I don't know where she thinks she's going when the city is filled with these mobsters who are following her. But the apartment she goes to is dirty as hell. The the bedroom has like one of those like round beds like for for love making. (laughs) But in the morning when she wakes up, she cooks or tries to cook. So Gloria can't cook. I thought that was really funny. Then we see her walking around the apartment like after she's tried to cook. And she's like like in her house coat, like a robe. But she's carrying her purse like the little boy's going to steal from her. I thought that was funny. Then very early on, like because she's running around the city with this boy, she realizes like she she can't go on with him. Mm Mm-hmm. And she tells, she makes up all these excuses to him. And at one point she's like, I'm overweight. I'm out of shape. Like you just go <laughs> like, actually she looks fantastic. She does. She's 50. She there. looks fantastic. Yeah. So I thought that was funny. Then right after she says that some mobsters show up in a car mm-hmm. and she pulls out that gun and they're talking to her like, bitch, come give, on. Give us this kid. You know, like, you know how this is going down. Just give us the kid. We're not going to bother you. And then she pulls out a gun and shoots up the joint. <laughs> I thought, and then the car crashes. Uh That was funny. I also like after the apartment scene where she gets the kid out of there and they're chasing after her in the taxi and she's daring him to come, to come up to her. She's like, I dare you. Come on, keep coming. Yeah. And her hair looks great. Uh, Her her, her hair always looks great. Okay. The score is doing a lot of work. Bill (laughs) Conti's score is, is going, is going to hyperdrive. It is doing a lot of work. But I didn't mind that because sometimes it, that, coalesced really well for me I thought in the subway sure I'm not saying I mean it's just doing a lot of work Mm -hmm. which I would watch this in a theater again Mm -hmm. again if someone wants to uh, buy tickets and take us he (laughs) so Cassavetes this Cassavetes was sure that this film I'm just putting that out there because I'm surprised more people don't reach out to us wanting to meet or like take us out for drinks watch movies with us wouldn't you think that would be Well, because we're such a delight. People will comment, like, I'd love to watch a movie with you. Mm -hmm. But then I'm surprised that no one ever asks. Hmm. Like, you don't think that's interesting that people don't ask? We're, I I think we're in a world where people don't usually do that anymore. And we live in, like, a big city. It's not like we live in, like, rural Oklahoma where no one would have access to us. Sure. I'm not saying, like randomly email us and I'll invite you to our house. But I think it's interesting that more people don't. Um, sure. But uh, I think it, Cassavetes was sure that this film wasn't going to be much of anything. It ended up being kind of the best uh, reviewed film of his career. I can't I, believe I don't, that. I don't think it's his best, but I do really like it. Uh, my favorite, because more of his, his, because this is a pretty straightforward film from him. And again, it makes sense because he was trying to sell this script. Uh, but a lot of films owe their origins to this, including Luc Besson's The Professional. I think that terrible movie that Taylor Sheridan directed with Angelina Jolie, uh, Those Who Wish Me Dead. This is, you know, very much owes a lot to uh, Gloria. I, I think that uh, the reason I chose this for this week is because we're going to be reviewing Nine Bullets, starring Lena Lena. Heady. Which you know is not going to be a good No, one. but it's just... It just even so I watch, think it's funny that you want to do extra research uh, to prepare. But watching the trailer for that, it's like, we can't talk about this without you having not seen Gloria. But sure. my, my favorite cast of it, his films are usually so weird and kind of unclassifiable is what makes them so such a delight. But I really like Love Streams, where he plays brother and sister with his wife. Oh. And... Um, 
and he had been diagnosed as like they didn't think they thought he was going to die before he could finish filming it. Oh, uh, so there's this just this frantic, weird energy. Uh, L.A. set story for him too, uh, and I really like uh, opening night mm. with General. Well, I want to finish these notes for this movie, but so at a point, Gloria's like. I, I need to get money from the bank. Mm-hmm. Like she acts like, oh, I just need to go get like a hundred dollars. And then she shows up at the bank. She goes, I want to take all my money. And all I, and my note was, she does not know how to act in a bank because she just walks in to the teller and says, I need all of my money out of the bank. And, the, and then the bank teller's like, okay, from like checking or saving from my safe deposit box. And he's like, oh, well you have to go to the bank, like assistant manager. And before he can even say assistant manager, she's like, Goodbye. <laughs> And then she walks over to the assistant manager, and he's like, um, "He goes, how oh, I are helped you? you before." Well, no, she. He, he goes, "How are you doing?" And she goes, "How am I doing? Do I know you?" And he goes, "I've helped you." He's before. like, "I've helped you before." And then I don't know if it was Casavetti's trying to maybe imp- like imply that the mob might have gotten to these people too. But then every person she talks to, she's like, "I need to take my money out of the safe deposit box." The purpose of a safe deposit box, bitch, is that no one's supposed to know what's in it. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't run around telling everyone you have money in the safe deposit box. Then she goes to the part, like, the safe and telling the man, like, can I be alone with my money? Lady, we don't know what's in the box unless you tell us. Like, why are you acting like... And apparently she has, like, a million bucks in there. Uh, okay. There was a scene that ma- creeped me out so much. Oh, boy. When I- Gloria and Phil... It's like the second night they're in a hotel. Phil makes like the, like puts the moves on her. Uh-huh. Like he wants to be like sexual with her. Mm-hmm. But and has no idea what that means. No, but she's talking to him like he does. And I thought that was really uncomfortable and creepy. Well, because he's also in his little underwear. Yes. But it's weird because it's two people that don't know how to, he doesn't know what he's saying, but he's told that he has to be the man, which however he learned that in his mind, that's what men do. And she doesn't know how to talk to children. You're right. What they're doing makes sense to, to the story on paper, but because this shit is so poorly acted by the kid and the screw, the dialogue so bad, it's like, this is really uncomfortable. Sure. Instead of what you're saying, because yes, it makes sense that she's established, she doesn't know how to handle kids, he's supposed to be a man, of course he's going to try this. But that scene was so cringy. Then they go to the cemetery. Well, I'll save that for a second. She, why does Gloria keep saying he can't speak English? All the boy speaks is English. <laughs> she keeps saying it. Like, she says it a couple times to try to make him seem like he's a, like no threat, but then she's also saying it like that's what she thinks. I think, but he only speaks English and he speaks it quite well. I, I think that it's also because th- there's a race thing going on too. Because he's um, mixed. He's, he's half white and half Puerto, Puerto Rican. Rican. So I, I think that, that there is a component of that that's evident in this film. Um, they go eat at a restaurant. And that scene was so... God, just like these scenes are so crunchy. Like the server is acting like a zombie. Oh, yeah. And then the kid orders... Pie. He wants apple pie with vanilla ice cream. And she's like, we don't have apple pie. Well, what do you have? Peach. Okay, give me peach with vanilla ice cream. And then she's just acting like a zombie. And then Gloria tells her to, like, beat it. Yeah. And the woman comes back. (laughs) And I laugh so hard inside because she brought this boy what looked like blueberry pie Mm -hmm. with chocolate ice cream. Mm Mm-hmm. I can't think of a more disappointing (laughs) dessert offering than fucking blueberry pie with chocolate ice cream. Mm -hmm. Oh, (laughs) that took me out. And then that's followed by Gloria. Like somehow the same restaurant is filled with the mobsters. Yes. And that's where we meet one of the mobsters who she keeps referring to as a sissy. And I don't know if that's because he has longer hair, but this actor looked like if you combined Richard Ramirez, the night stalker with Ezra Miller. Oh, my God. oh <laughs> we actually, didn't talk about Ezra Miller. No. What did you want to say about Ezra Miller? Ooh, child. Uh, I, I know he got in trouble and then Warner brothers is like reevaluating his future. They put everything him. on pause. But, uh, I, you know, I remember my sister sending me footage of him a couple months ago or even longer of him punching this girl, slapping this girl. Uh, she was a, a fan and I remember there was, I guess that got brushed under the carpet, but he's had a lot of bizarre behaviors and statements. 
or he, I sorry, I keep missing they, he, they um, which is unfortunate uh, to say the least. Well, moving on, what is most disappointing about this film to me is her character appears to have no plan, which is weird because she's clearly smart. She clearly has a lot of experience with the mob. So it's not like she's blind to the po- po- possibilities. And she has all of the money. Like, she has a ton of money on her. So my next note is, like, this movie for, a, like, a big chunk of it just feels like the same thing. Like, like, like the same 10 minutes on loop. Okay. Like, she runs into a mobster, has to get away from sure. them. Then she has time with the boy. He gets upset. Then they go do something else. But she meets a mobster. She resolves it. The boy is acting weird. Reset. Do it again. But that the, happens but several the, times. But the through line is it's supposed to allow them to develop as characters and having this relationship. Sure, but I don't think it's... Uh, it, it, it It's not sophisticated in a way that... Well, I mean, again, it's just like the little boy's acting is so terrible. The dialogue's terrible. <laughs> And the story is so basic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's but, so basic. But again, that has been recycled and used a lot. Gloria is very well put together. And this lady is on the run and has many garments. <laughs> yes, she does. But she's only carrying what looks like a little... I mean, it almost looks like the... I mean, it's it looks like a large handbag. It's not even as big as like a bag you would take to the beach. So it's not even a duffel. It, it just looks like a large handbag. But at one point, she... Well, first of all, she has beautiful outfits. That one of them looks like a silk skirt set mm-hmm. that clearly would have needed to be pressed, mm-hmm. but somehow. <laughs> but there's a scene where she tells little Phil like hang up her clothes in the in the <laughs> hotel, and she has a full rack of garments, <laughs> and they're very elegant, and she always looks very put together. Also, we the- even they they make a note or you know efforts taken to show her like washing her hair, mm-hmm. and it's like when did she have time to style her hair? Because we see her hair drying, like mm-hmm. in the, se- the the creepy scene in the bed, mm-hmm. her cl- her hair is t- clearly like textured hair, mm-hmm. so it air dries not straight. But then we see that she has styled it. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a really weird choice. Like, what? sure, how does this lady look so great? <laughs> and she's on the run. Also, uh, they kind of forgot to go back about the cat. That's right. She has a cat as she's leaving. But she seems very attached to it. And then she just totally forgets about it. Well, because the kid takes off running. We hear his parents get slaughtered. Yeah, you hear shotguns. It's disturbing. (laughs) And then he tries to run to the apartment. She's got her cat in her head. This big fat tabby. And then she has to throw the cat down and run after him. And then we never see the cat again. He's not even in the apartment. Where'd he go? There's a scene where she's in a cab with some other person affiliated with the mob. And that mm-hmm. person's being weird. And so the cab driver's like, hey, like, whatever y'all are doing right there, stop that. And the man calls the cab driver an ape. <gasps> yeah. And then when we see the cab driver, it is this huge black man. Yeah. Like, he's like seven feet tall. Um, he gets him together. He does. He's like, get the fuck out of my... Uh... <laughs> fuck out of my cab but uh yeah that man was huge i thought that was funny my last note is there could be a drinking game for every time she asks someone if they have change for a hundred dollar (laughs) bill like you would be drunk (laughs) because she has all this money and it's all hundred yeah and she's trying to pay everyone because there's the first scene where she is in the cab and taken to the cemetery with the boy and the time to pay the fare and she's like do you have change for a hundred? And he says no. And she goes, "Well, okay. Well, we need to ride back. So just, just wait. You know, or just come back in fifteen yeah. minutes." Yeah. And I thought, bitch, that man's not coming back in fifteen minutes. He's gonna take your hundred dollar bill. And why would he leave? Why would he just wait for fifteen mm-hmm. minutes? Right. I thought that was so stupid. But overall, I think uh, this is a. I, I'm so shocked reading because I was reading like the reviews and the consensus. I'm so so shocked people think this is a good movie. I can't believe she got nominated for an Academy Award. Really, she's fantastic, but like, I I, I don't know how you can be nominated and so, like your opposite is giving one of the worst performances. Well, I've that seen. happens all the time. Think of Glenn Close and The Wife, which you didn't see, but I started it. Um, no, you're right. It, it, it's just, I, I was very shocked I think that, that this film got uh, uh, acclaim in that way. And also that w- the reviews I'm reading, like people love this movie. I think it's a fun watch. Again, I would watch it in a theater again. Again, I think there was very few, there, you know, there weren't a lot of uh, 
kind of depictions of women being this strong and resilient either. Sure. I mean, sure, but I, that, that doesn't mean that it's a good movie. Like, I think it's... It, this dialogue, this script, the storytelling, it's just... Sure, but... To I, me, it just seems, like, so off. Yeah, but her performance is pretty damn good. Sure. Like, she sells it, you know? Sure. She does sell as, it. As a vibe on screen. But but I think as an actor and a, and a personality, she's strong. But the words coming out of her mouth don't make any damn sense. <laughs> like... <laughs> I, I really... Rec- I think... Um, I would love to hear what you think of A Woman Under the Influence... Uh, which I think is considered her most notable uh, performance. But she's great. You know, uh, Faces, um, she's great in Woody Allen's Another Woman. Uh, so many things. I, the last film she did, because she's, you know, she's born in 1930. Uh, she, I happened to see a press screening. I remember showing you the poster art for it with Cheyenne Jackson. Uh, six Dances in Six Days or something was. Oh that? yeah, I think I watched the trailer. Actually. That was 2014. That that was her last feature. Um, she's passed. No, she's still alive. Oh, oh, but oh. you know, it's hard. You might recognize her from the Skeleton Key as well. Anyway, uh, so uh, this episode's long. Mm-hmm. Do so. What do we have this week? Tomorrow we're going to watch Father Stew. Father Stu, and then uh, I'm really kind of curious about this Hulu series, oh, Captive Audience. You just told me about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm familiar with this. It's a docu series mm-hmm. about. I don't want to read the full thing, but it's about Stephen Stainer Jr., who I recall from the '80s was this boy who was kidnapped when he was like seven. And then he returned to his family as a teenager. And the reason I know him is because there was a made-for-TV movie, like a two-part thing called... What is it called? My Name is Steve? Like, my name is... I Know My First Name is Steven. It's called I Know My First Name is Steven. Starring Cindy Pickett. And I remember watching that as a kid with my mom um, and being so scared because, of course, as a kid, watching stories about child abduction. But... Oh, yeah. Jacob Wetterling in my household? Yeah. But... The Hulu series you're referring to, it's called Captive Audience, A Real American Horror Story. Apparently, this kid's family is associated with, like, the murder of, like, four four women being brutally murdered, Mm -hmm. like, many years later. Mm -hmm. So, I'm very interested. But, maybe, maybe we could, it might be fun to watch, I Know My First Name is Steven. First? Or... Yeah, watch it and maybe make that a secret movie or sure. Well, you're because I don't want to review it, but your cho- it's your call next week. Um, there's also uh, another uh, Harry Potter universe, uh, Fantastic Beasts: The Secrets of Dumbledore. Speaking of Ezra Miller, oh, you're the, watching that. See, yeah, speaking of Ezra Miller, they are in this film. Um, what else are we watching? Oh, Duel with Karen Gillan. Uh, oh, that her, looks interesting. Which I saw out of Sundance. Uh, a choose or die on Netflix. I think you're skipping most of the other things this week, but yeah. And then Northman, we've actually already seen a lot of things for the week ahead of that, but do you have anything to close us with? Uh, are you reading anything? No, oh, I'm reading port noise complaint by Philip Roth, which there are whole pages of that, that I think are just fun and hilarious. Uh, so I'm, I'm really digging that. Uh, but yeah, that that's it. Goodbye. Bye.